All right, everybody, my name is Eric Hayden. I'm a meteorologist with the Weather Service in Newport, Moorhead City. This is our flood sky warning class. I told some folks that logged on earlier, very excited for this. This is the first time we've done this here at our office. The goal is to talk about flooding, talk about um, you know some types of flooding we get in our area with the ultimate goal being that you report information to us, whether you have a rain gauge or you actually observe uh, flooding itself. If you ever have any questions, my email is at the bottom of the screen. You will also receive this presentation in a PDF format sent to your email via our website. So um, if you logged in and you registered for the class and you don't hear from me in the next week, please verify that you entered the correct uh, email information. This is actually the third year we've done online classes. In a traditional year, we have in-person classes, maybe about 15 to 20 per uh, spring season and up to 10 during the winter season. And then we'll have a couple virtual classes. Given our current situation, we've expanded this. So instead of our traditional spring sky warn, we have a lot of new ones like this flood one. Like I said, on our website, you'll be able to download this PDF. If I go too quick, you wanna review, you wanna share it with somebody, you can just go to our website here listed. In addition, uh, thanks to Mike Lee, one of our coworkers here at the Weather Service, he's awesome with graphics. He made a whole set of new certificates with this being a new class, it's the first time we've had a certificate for this one. You're gonna love it. So um, based on the email that you signed up with, you'll get that in your inbox. I know Will and a couple other folks already asked some questions through the webinar, um, or they let me know my audio wasn't working. I appreciate that. So you can ask me a question. I'll probably get to it at the end of the class itself. We're aiming for about 40 minutes, um, then we'll turn it over to you. Nobody sees these questions, so you can ask anything you want. And if you have a microphone, let's say you have a mobile device like this, um, you can ask questions verbally. You just wanna raise your hand. And again, I probably won't get to those until the end of class itself, because I'm presenting. So it's kind of hard to see um, the questions coming in at the same time. So very similar to our other Skywarn classes, we're gonna go over who the Weather Service is, what Skywarn is, and then where we go down a different path, since this is a flood class, we're gonna talk about flood history in our area. We're gonna focus on the different types of flooding we can get. I'm sure you knew we get a lot of flooding from tropical storms and hurricanes. We're gonna talk about how the flooding can be localized sometimes, and also for the friends along the coast, how you can get coastal flooding. We're gonna cover what a flash flood is, and then throughout the class, we're gonna review how we want you to report that information to us. If you're new to this, please remember, this is just one of many classes we offer. Our traditional classes in the spring cover uh, severe weather like tornadoes, thunderstorms, and lightning. Then the sister class to that is in the winter. It talks about winter snowfall measurement. Those are our two main classes. Then throughout the year, we have additional classes as needed. This flood uh, skywarn class, we have a tropical skywarn, which talks more about hurricane history, and then an advanced skywarn, that's a follow-up to our basic. All of this information is on our website, and again, to your email that you signed up with, you'll be sent a certificate. In addition, a lot of links included our website itself, so you can continue to stay informed. Speaking of that, if you like these classes, let's say you haven't taken the winter one yet or you haven't taken the basic one and this is your first time seeing us, don't worry. Go to our website and if you scroll down a little bit, I'm gonna try to draw it on here a little bit. If you scroll down just a little bit, there's a, a current schedule section. That's where you can stay informed on what's coming up. But on the far right, there's a YouTube training. And if you click on that, there's a lot of recorded training that we have there. Incidentally, this class that we're teaching right now as soon as I get it downloaded and edited, I will put it on our YouTube channel. So again, you can review or share with friends. So that's our housekeeping. Now let's get started with the class itself. First things first, the weather service. We have over 100 offices in the country. I know we have some folks that are not from Eastern North Carolina. I know Will joined us up from the uh, state of Maine. Your local office will forward information to you on how they want to report. And we'll cover that here in a second. As far as our local office is concerned, we're, we cover the eastern quarter of North Carolina. So places like Jacksonville and Greenville, if you've ever been to the Outer Banks or the Crystal Coast, those are areas we cover. The rest of the state is covered by our sister offices. Raleigh covers the central part of the state. Wilmington covers the southeast part of the state. And then the Wakefield or Richmond office covers up across northeast North Carolina. 
one big thing with the weather service is we are open 24 7 year-round holidays weekends to serve you our main mission is protection of life and property you can see from the picture this is our office during florence the lower left is a brick building our brick building with hurricane shutters so we're in a reinforced building to stay put when the weather gets bad so we stay here uh, we have backup offices that can take over if need be uh, but when the weather gets bad that's when we stay put and we continue to issue those watches warnings and advisories so that's a little bit about the weather service open 24 7 offices all over the country and again the main mission is protection of life and property where skywarn comes in it's a volunteer program run by the weather service to provide us with ground truth reports of what's happening so in the case of flooding how much rain do you have how fast did it fall do you have flooding where you live how deep is it what's being impacted those are some things that we want to know these reports are crucial because they really let us know how bad it is in your area uh, we have an event going on right now called the king tides there's certain periods of the year where we have abnormally higher than normal tides and lower than normal tides and we need reports of flooding that tells us how you know what types of businesses are being impacted what's actually going on and this is life-saving information because we can add it to our warnings and people are going to take it much more serious when they can relate to it oh first second and third street are closed because of water that means something to them if they live in the local area a couple definitions to go over we talk about these in all of our classes watches and warnings a watch means that conditions are favorable for something to happen a warning means it's imminent or it is already occurring so the example would be say a flash flood watch doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get flooding but we think all the ingredients are there heavy rain maybe it's rained a lot recently uh, and so forth whereas if we upgrade to a warning that means we expect it to happen a true flash flood is something that occurs in a very short period of time, um, at least less than six hours and often less than three. And usually this is caused by heavy rain. So think of that heavy thunderstorm that produces rainfall and causes flooding in a short period of time. The next couple of slides I want to go over um, how to get information from us. The easiest way is our website. Just remember weather.gov. Um, if you live anywhere else in the country, you'll just click on your part of the state that you live in. Um, so if you're up in Maine, you click on Maine, and if it's the southern part, you're covered by the Portland office. Here in Newport, we cover the eastern quarter, uh, quarter of the state. But again, no matter where you are, once you get to your local office, if you just enter your city or zip code or click on the map, you get a special forecast. We start off with a seven-day forecast. How warm is it going to be? Is it going to rain? How windy is it going to be? Kind of the quick and dirty forecast. And if you scroll down the page, you can get the hourly weather forecast, a graphical forecast, really anything you, you, you need. We default to kind of basic, and then we allow you to get more detailed um, as you desire. We mentioned that hourly forecast. I love it. You can um, click on the map, scroll down to the hourly part, and check on and off what you want. In this case, we're talking temperatures and wind speed, and it looks like sky cover. If you only care about temperatures and wind, you can display that, so it's very, very useful. On our website, we also do weather briefings only when the weather's bad. So if you go on there uh, for weeks or months at a time, it might be completely blank. But if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, if we're anticipating bad weather, we'll put out a briefing, and it's usually a couple slides, um, usually up to 10 or 15, uh, depending on the weather itself. The example on the left is from Florence where we were emphasizing uh, the water issue. And the other example on the right is from a winter storm we had a couple years ago in January. Again, these are for you. Uh, you can look at them when there's bad weather. We are big on social media. If you have not followed us yet, I highly encourage you to do so. Just search NWS Moorhead City. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And we really use uh, Facebook to get out the message and kind of wave our hands and say, this is what you should focus in on. The perfect example of that is Hurricane Florence. The example on the lower left, a lot of folks saw that the category of the storm, which is only related to wind, was decreasing from a four to a three down to a one. And we were concerned that people weren't going to take it serious. So we wanted people to really refocus on all of the impacts with the storm and not to let their guard down. 
YouTube, we put a lot of recordings on there. It's not on a daily basis like we do Facebook and Twitter. Uh, this webinar or this recording will be on there. Any of our Skywarns are on there. Uh, and then we also have some pretty cool videos. Um, if you've ever seen a, um, a weather balloon launch, we have video of that and also some tours of our office. One of the most frequent questions I get asked is, do we have an app? The answer is no, but we do have a mobile site that you can use very similar. If you go to mobile.weather.gov, on your computer, you can bookmark it. On your smart device, you can, whether it's an iPad, iPhone, Android, you can save it to your home screen. By adding it to your home screen, it will act very similar to an app, and it'll give you access anywhere in the country to your local forecast office. Before we go much further, I want to take the time to kind of take a step back and focus on the important part of the class. We're going to start to get on hurricanes and flooding and all the different types of weather we can get. We do that because we want you to know a little bit more about the science, but our main goal is you report to us rainfall amounts and flooding. That's the whole goal of the class. The other stuff is kind of gravy. It's just for you to understand. And the way we want you to make those reports is our 800 number. That's the best way because we can ask you questions and ask for clarification. If you don't live in Eastern North Carolina, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to send the whole list of you to your local offices and they will follow up with you. Um, the reporting procedure is the same, but you don't use this 800 number and you're not going to use email. The reason, you're going to call our office and it's not going to be for your area and it won't match up. Uh, so again, that 800 number is only for Eastern North Carolina. When you report who you are, what you saw, where and when is very, very important. Another way you can report is using our email address. Again, this is only for Eastern North Carolina. If you're in Oklahoma, New York State or Maine, your procedures will probably be the same, but your email and phone number will be different. Again, who you are, what you saw, where, and when. The 800 number is preferred, but you can use email, and I'm going to follow up at the end with social media to show us pictures and video. So, again, call the 800 number, tell us what's going on, and we'll cover that here coming up. Um, and then you can follow up uh, with a picture or video um, through email or our social media. Just trying to uh, emphasize the 800 number is certainly our most preferred way. So we're gonna cover one of the biggest ways we can get flooding in our area, probably no shock. Some of our biggest events are certainly hurricanes. And we'll go over exactly what a hurricane is. Um, you may not know this, but in our neck of the woods, including the Central and Eastern Pacific and all the Atlantic Ocean, a hurricane is called a hurricane. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia, it's called a willy willy, a cyclone in the Indian Ocean and a typhoon in the Western Pacific. It is the exact same thing we just call it a different thing depending on where we live in the world. Hurricanes get their energy from warm ocean water. In fact, once you get above 80 degrees, they can really strengthen and get larger. Um, so this is why as hurricanes move on land, they eventually die off because they've lost their energy source. They need that warm, moist air to converge and rise and form more showers and thunderstorms. If you saw any of our weather basic classes, that uh, red L is an area of low pressure. So hurricanes are a strong area of low pressure. But the big thing is hurricanes get their energy from the ocean itself. And this is why our hurricane season is not until the late spring and summer as those water temperatures start to warm up. You probably have heard of the eye of the hurricane. That's a center part of the storm and a very well-defined eye where you can actually see a hole um, that's the satellite. As you're looking down on the storm, there's an absence of clouds. That's because that air is rising so fast um, that it's actually clear and very, very light winds right at the center of the hurricane. It's kind of misleading, though, because around the eye of the hurricane is the eye wall. That is the strongest part of the hurricane where we see the strongest winds and the heaviest rainfall. If you've lived in our part of the country, unfortunately, we've had experience going back to Matthew, Florence, uh, and then um, uh, most recently Dorian this past fall. It's hard to imagine that was just not that many months ago. You know that with a hurricane, there's these bands of spiral rain bands that produce heavier rain and also gusty winds. In addition, in some of those outer bands, again, as the storm's rotating around, we can get some tornadoes uh, occurring. 
So now we're going to talk about some of the different ways we can get flooding. Um, you're going to see that we can get flooding from hurricanes. That's probably not a shock. But you might be surprised some other ways we can get flooding. This is one of the more historical ones. For some of the you youngsters, you might not remember this. This was Hurricane Floyd in 1999. Not to date myself, but I was in the third year of, of college at that point. Uh, so uh, at this point, you know, Hurricane Floyd uh, was a big one. It did hit across the North Carolina coastline. This was kind of the benchmark for flooding in our area um, before Matthew and before Florence. On the a picture on the left is a rainfall map. It doesn't always work this way, but a lot of times to the left of the forecast track is the heaviest rain. Um, so you can see in this example, uh, to the left of the track, we saw some purples, uh, 15 to 20 inches of rain. And Grifton, um, up in our area, was a place that was devastated by the flooding of Hurricane Florence. So hurricanes can certainly produce uh, heavy rain. Um, that is common in our area, unfortunately, with our climate. Another way we can get flooding is not just related to hurricanes, but we can get flooding. Let's say storms go over the same area over and over again. We would call this training. Or if storms just kind of stay stationary and they don't move, this can produce a flash flooding. And we saw this in 2009 in Havelock, North Carolina. If you're not familiar with uh, North Carolina, that's down toward the coast. Uh, roughly between Moorhead City and New Bern. Uh, so this is uh, 2009. The image on the right is radar, uh, an estimation of how much rain has fallen. Our radar can estimate the rain. We always appreciate reports because you can confirm it. But what we're showing you here is the area that is shaded in um, you know, that darker yellow and red, that is very, very heavy rain. In fact, some locations measured 10 inches of rain in four hours. That's the equivalent of about three months worth of rainfall. On an average month, we usually get about three inches. So that's about three months worth of rain, four hours. Up toward Cherry Point, there was a measurement of six inch uh, per hour rates. So that wasn't an amount of rain, but it was falling that hard. And this was all from a stalled out front uh, or, or sea breeze. We get these sea breezes that come in off the ocean. It wouldn't move. And unfortunately, we had some flooding. You can see from the, the picture on the left, up toward Havelock. So we established hurricanes can produce rain. We, we probably already knew that. L the rain can be localized. 10 inches of rain in four hours is, is quite unbelievable. We had that 2009 in Havelock. Again, most of the area was okay, so you might not remember it, but if you're from Havelock, uh, you probably remember that event. Another way we can get heavy rain is from a nor'easter, which is an area of low pressure that's very, very strong. In this came, case, we had Hurricane Joaquin that was farther out in the ocean and that funneled uh, moisture toward our area. From the map, you can see, for the most part, the heaviest rain itself um, was mainly toward um, the South Carolina area. So kind of kind of the upstate or um, downstate part of South Carolina. Uh, in addition, it was, um, you know, some rain across eastern North Carolina, but it certainly wasn't one of our heaviest rains. Uh, you can see, by and large, the heaviest rain was down toward uh, South Carolina itself. However, it did pile up water off the ocean because of that persistent wind. And the picture on the right is from Beaufort, North Carolina, and that is some flooding that occurred um, in the Beaufort area, and that was something we call coastal flooding. So we certainly want to know about coastal flooding. A couple more of the more notable ones, we covered Floyd. Matthew was certainly a notable storm, uh, again, for flooding mainly in our area. We didn't see a lot of wind. The storm made landfall along the Carolinas and kind of just meandered off the South Carolina, North Carolina coast and then went out to sea. Uh, the most noteworthy thing was definitely the heavy rainfall. Uh, this is what I mean by the radar. We can estimate how much rain has fallen. Not always perfect, but it gives us an idea. And think back to, uh, we were talking about the spiral rain, rain bands. Uh, so this is our radar site right down there where the, the hole is, the black hole. But I'm gonna circle these areas of darker purple and yellow. And notice how they're not spread out everywhere. They're in these bands. And this is what I'm talking about, those rain bands that can come on shore. Not everybody sees the heavy rainfall sometimes. Sometimes it's spread out, and other times it's in these banded areas, and we certainly saw that with Matthew. And these rain bands can certainly produce some heavy rainfall. Uh, these are a couple of different images. Uh, we saw a lot of rain across the state, uh, 10 to 15 inches. Uh, here in Moorhead City, we didn't see a lot. A lot of our heavy rain was down toward Duplin County, 
uh, and then toward Interstate 95, where we saw some of the bad flooding. Uh, so just northwest of here, uh, this is Vanceboro. This is during Matthew. Uh, this is near Grifton, also during Matthew. You can see that the water was so strong, you can actually see the ripples um, in the water right there. And again, this is next to a road. This is not the ocean. This is um, you know ripples in the water from the flow itself. This is an image we use a lot. This is near Hookerton. Um, this is one of the harder hit areas during Matthew. You see your typical road. If you see in the distance, it was there was a barricade um, closing it off. So a lot of times those are closed off for a reason. Do not cross it because you don't know what is underneath it. Water is very powerful. Only takes a couple feet to sweep you away and you don't know if the road is not there anymore. Um, so flooding is very, very dangerous. Our big campaign with that is turn around, don't drown. Um, most people that die in floods occur in vehicles. It's not that they, the water comes up and they don't know about it. It's that they're going places they shouldn't go. Our last example is the most recent one, Hurricane Florence in 2018. Uh, the graphic on the left is the satellite. It's showing the cooler cloud tops. The one on the right is the radar out of Wilmington. Um, you can see this was a sped up, uh, uh, this map was sped up, but it's from Friday into Saturday. It was a very, very slow moving storm. Uh, most of us saw rain Thursday, Friday, Saturday, ending on Sunday. So it was a three to four day storm. And the biggest thing with Florence, yes, we had wind speeds and we certainly had storm surge, uh, but the historic flooding due to the rainfall was probably the most memorable thing for most of us. These are rainfall totals from spotters and uh, trained weather observers. So we really appreciate that. Some of them are from the local airports, almost 35 inches of rain in Swansboro. Again, tremendous amount of rain, and it was over a multiple uh, day period. We'll zoom out uh, and show you our specific area. A couple things I wanna point out, large, large area of more than 10 inches of rain. So I'll kind of try to circle that. Uh, but you'll notice in the southwest part of our area, we had some white on um, that set bullseye of 30 inches of rain. So a lot of us had rain. And the other area I want to point out is the northern Outer Banks and the northern and eastern part of our area that didn't see a lot of rain. The next tropical system we get, because unfortunately we know we're going to get another one, when you're looking at a rainfall forecast and you see heavy rain is anywhere in your general vicinity, treat it as if it could happen to you. Uh, the forecast with uh, Florence was very accurate uh, because of the storm track from the hurricane system uh, center was very accurate. But any slight sh shift, 50 to 70 miles, and this whole heavy rain area would have shifted northward. So my whole point with this slide is, yes, we had heavy rain. It was well predicted. Some of us didn't see it, and you were very lucky. You may not be that lucky next time around. So when you're watching hurricanes and the tracks and the, and the maps, don't treat it as I'm in it or I'm out of it. If you're anywhere in the general vicinity of that path, um, you are at risk for being impacted. So please keep that in mind. Here's a wider perspective, a beautiful map when you're talking about just geography and showing the rainfall. And again, the center of the storm, we talk about this a lot, that from the center of the storm, impacts can occur well away. I'm drawing a red dot about where the center was as it approached landfall. But then notice this whole area all through the Carolinas that saw heavy rainfall. Uh, so just to reemphasize that wherever the hurricane strikes is not the only uh, place impacted, impacts can occur well away from it. We'll skedaddle through that one because we already covered um, the uh, Matthew flooding. A couple examples of the uh, impacts from Florence. Um, when we talked about historic Floyd-like levels, that got people's attention. We actually exceeded record values uh, Chincapin and some other places in our area, you can see, unfortunately, the, the road washouts we had in Duplin County. Water is very, very powerful. It can sweep you away. It can wash out the road. Stay home when there's flooding. Just stay where you, you are. Um, you don't want to be out driving. This is an example of the Trent River in Pollocksville. Again, exceeded our record flood. The highest it had ever been in recorded history was during Flo uh, Floyd, 1999, for a lot of these folks and we crested unfortunately above that. So we talked a lot about flood history. What do we want from you? Anytime you have flooding in your area, something significant or rarely seen, we wanna know about it. Um, the roads are being covered by water. How deep is it? I don't want you going out there measuring, but tell me, is it up to the stop sign? Is it up to the hubcaps? If you live along the coast, let us know. Is your water above normal? 
one, two, three feet above normal? Do you have a staff gauge? A lot of you folks that live along the coast are very in tune with the weather, and we would appreciate you letting us know what's going on. This last part of the presentation, we're at about the 25 minute mark. The last 15 minutes is going to exclusively talk about a rain gauge. Highly encourage you to get one. If you have one, if you get an inch of rain in a long period of time like a day or in less than an hour, we want to know about it. Um, the reason why the rain gauge is important, telling us about flooding, you know, you can verbally and visually tell us what's going on, but knowing how much rain fell, that can help us even when you don't have flooding because we can look back at the radar and see how the radar is doing. The easiest way to get this rain gauge I'm talking about is to go to cocoraws.org. If I go through it too quickly, this is one of those links I send in your email. So jot it down, think about it. In my follow-up email, you're gonna have this direct link. That's where you can get online training. You can get um, you know, places to purchase your rain gauge and sign up. Doesn't take very long at all. Part of the training is what you're gonna see here. Uh, we do a separate Coco Raws presentation. It's about 45 minutes. It's more in depth, kind of the A to Z. I'm giving you the concise what you need to get started after you get your rain gauge. So really encourage you to buy that four inch rain gauge as soon as you can. So we're going to talk about setting up. Where should you put this rain gauge? Uh, location is the key to good data. You don't want to keep the rain gauge in your box. Not going to do any good. And I did this as a kid. I, I must admit, I had a little pickle jar and I had rain gauges near the downspouts because I wanted to the most rain in the area. Obviously that's not accurate, but I, I do remember doing that as a kid. Um, you want to be away from tall objects. You don't wanna be under a tree. You don't wanna be probably on your deck. The deck is a nice place to screw it into, but that's close to your house. The rough rule is you wanna be away from objects um, like you know buildings and trees. A fence, it's an okay place. It's probably away from your house. Uh, but you can see from this example, there is some wind that goes up and over the gauge because of the fence, and that could artificially um, mess up your measurements. Some ideal places, it's going to depend on where you are. You want to be, again, away from tall objects, away from buildings, out in the open as much as possible. If you are in a rural location or residential location, the two on the left, you have it the easiest. Where today in your yard is away from trees, and, and the fences and tall objects. That's where you wanna be. If you live in a more urban environment, it's going to be more of a challenge. Doesn't mean you don't measure, just get as far away as you can. For some of you that have a lot of trees, just do the best you can. You know, you don't wanna be right underneath it, but your best you can may not be as good as somebody else's. Just do uh, the best you can and that's all we're asking. As far as distance, you don't have to get out there and get a ruler, but roughly twice as far from that object. So if you have a 30 foot pine tree, you wanna be about 60 feet away. Again, you don't need to measure it, just kind of gives you a ballpark for how far away you, you should be. In this example in the lower right, the gentleman's out away from his house and equal distance, equal distance uh, right in the middle between those two tall trees. As far as height above ground goes, it's not as big of a deal um, as placement. And what I mean by is roughly chest level is fine. Um, the example on the top, if it's a really open field, um, two feet is probably better because you have so much wind going through there. By being close to the ground, you're reducing the uh, issues with wind and you're still above ground that you won't have any issues with animals. Mine, I think is about four or five feet. Again, chest level is fine. I have seen some automated weather stations. We, we don't want any automated stations in the in the Coco Raws program, but I've seen some that are mounted to roofs. That's okay for wind measurement, but it's terrible for a rain gauge, just terrible. And the reason is the higher you get up in the atmosphere, the windier it gets, less friction. And um, that just, it, it keeps your rain gauge from catching as much rain as it should. So again, chest level three, four, five feet is fine. You want to make sure your gauge is level. I'll use my my cup here. It's not. I should have brought my Coco Ross gauge in. It's it's outside. But let's pretend this is my gauge. You don't want it cockeyed or crooked because uh, then you're not capturing how much rain is falling in. So you certainly want it to be level. 
And if you do it on a post, I must admit this worked better than I thought. I got a four by four, got a friend to cut it at an angle, and you want that angle to slope away. This worked really, really well. My wife um, helped me get it in the ground, make sure everything was level, and that thing is is there permanent for a long, long time. So um, if you want to do it that way, a four by four uh, that you can get at your local hardware store would be fine. A couple more slides I'm measuring, then we're going to turn it over to you for any questions you might have. Uh, accuracy is really important when you're doing your gauge. The biggest issue with the gauge is decimals. If there's an inner tube and an outer tube. If it's anywhere in that inner tube, it's going to be point something, 0 0.4, 0 0.53, 0 0.99. You don't want to mess up the de decimal. I was teasing my younger son uh, today. He's six. Uh, we went out there and measured 23 hundredths, 0.23. And he said, uh, is that 23 inches? I said, no, no, no. You got to get the decimal right. So again, it's 0.23. Uh, so make sure you get the decimal right um, in there. And what I mean by that is that inner gauge measures up to 100, or yeah, measures up to an inch. Each tick is a hundredth of an inch. So 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, all the way to 0.99. Once it gets to an inch, it overflows into the extra uh, place. When you do measure the rain, uh, you wanna look at the meniscus, uh, not the thing in your knee, but that little area that kinda uh, goes down. Um, that's formed by the surface tension in the gauge itself. So the bottom of that curve, that is actually where you're uh, measuring. Uh, so don't, in this case, um, this example on the right is really good. You're gonna look at this line right here, um, not the one higher than that. This is what one half of an inch looks in the rain gauge. So again, 0 0.50, and that's what one inch. That gauge, the inner part measures up to one whole inch. What happens when you get more than an inch? What can happen here? What happens is that inner cylinder fills up and overflows into the outer part. This whole thing can measure 11 inches. One inch in the inner tube, 10 inches in the outer part. So what you're gonna have to do is some addition. Uh, so what you wanna do is pour the inner gauge out, write down that you had an inch, and then use the funnel and pour the remaining amount into the inner tube. And you might have to do this a couple times. And if you're getting old like me, you're gonna to wanna to write it down so that you don't forget. So in this example, you come out, you see your gauge, uh, the thing has overflowed into the outer part. You enter, um, empty out the inside, it's an inch. Then you use your funnel and you fill it almost way to the top. It's 0.97, write it down, dump it out. Fill it up again, and you're going to do it a couple more times, and then you got 3.77. So when you get more than an inch of rain, you are going to have to use the funnel and the inner tube to measure out a couple times. Be sure to write it down because it's easily, did it, was that that time that I measured it, 0.97, or was it the time before? So definitely want to write that down. All right, we're at the 32-minute mark, and we are on the home stretch. So. At the beginning, we stress the 800 number is the best way to call us, or if it's a rainfall report, you can do it through Coco Raws. Social media is great. We don't answer it all the time, so please call us if it's urgent. Social media is good for pictures and video. Call us, hey, I got four inches of rain, there's a lot of flooding, I wanna post a picture. You can do that to our uh, Facebook page, it's NWS Moorhead City, and same procedure, who you are, what you saw, when, and where. So when should you call us? Our focus has been on flooding, but as we wrap up the class, we wanna mention all the times you should call us. If you see a tornado or a funnel cloud, follow up with the basic class if you want more information. Again, that is on YouTube. Any size hail, we got a lot of great reports yesterday because we had all that hail up in the New Bern area and for some of us uh, yesterday evening. Wind damage, and again, any type of flooding or heavy rainfall. The other time you can call us is, I know we're far away from it, but anytime we get snow, the whole goal is to make you a year round spotter. So it's very likely you're gonna have rain or snow this year, let's face it. It's unlikely you're gonna have a tornado. We want you to get used to reporting to us so that when heaven forbid that you do get bad weather, you can call us and it's like second nature. So for snowfall, I know we're many months away from from that and hopefully remove from that um, you want to take a couple measurements measure to the nearest tenth of an inch and any accumulation of ice is good to know so that is it it's about 35 minutes we're trying to keep the virtual classes concise because we can't see 
if we're losing you, if it's too much or too little. The in-person classes are usually about an hour and 15 minutes just as guidance. So uh, before we totally wrap things up, I really hope you provide us with some feedback, what you like, what you didn't like, because um, we'll continue to do these classes um, going forward. And speaking of those, I hope a lot of you that are repeats are probably familiar with this uh, site, but our website link that I'm gonna send you to all of the recordings and PDFs are on the website. We've taken a lot of time to do this. It's not, not the easiest thing. I don't have the flood one up yet. This is the first time we've done it. So to this afternoon or maybe tomorrow, depends on how much more work I have to get done for that. But excuse me, you can see the Cocoa Raws online, all that stuff is on there. Our current schedule, you just did the flood Skywarn. Again, once it's completed and edited, sometimes it takes a couple hours, I will uh, post it as a recorded presentation so you can review. And if you like this and you don't mind hearing my voice, we have an advanced class. Um, we have a, a, excuse me, advanced class this Friday. And the way we're doing it is two for Tuesdays, uh, two classes on Tuesday at 10 and one, and then one class on Friday. Uh, at one o'clock. So we've got the advanced class this Friday and the next Tuesday and Friday we start all over again. Hurricane preparedness, tropical sky warm, we've only done once. It will be similar to this one, but more intense on the hurricane side of things. And our weather basics class, if you haven't done it, I think it's a lot of fun. It's again about 40, 45 minutes and it's fifth uh, grade weather standards. So that's it. I'm done. 